Let's turn over to John chapter 13, and I want to do a series this week that is, I believe, going to be a tremendous eye-opener to many of you. It's going to minister to you, challenge you, and at the same time bless you. But I want to talk from uh, John chapter 13. Real quickly, let me give you the context of this. This is the night before Jesus' crucifixion. He had already had communion with his disciples. He had washed the disciples' feet, and he revealed that Judas was the one that was going to betray him. And Judas had just had Satan enter into him, and he ran out. And um, so that is the context of what's happened. And then right after this uh, is when Jesus spoke to his disciples, John 14, 15, and 16, the night before his crucifixion and gave the instructions about let not your heart be troubled, etc. So this is the context. This is the night before the crucifixion of Jesus. And just by virtue of the fact that this is one of his last instructions, it has to be one of the most important things that he ever said. You know, if I had, say for instance that you were my disciples or something, and if we had been together for three and a half years, and if I was getting ready to leave and turn the whole thing over to you, I can guarantee you the last night before I was gone, I would be trying to emphasize, summarize, put an exclamation point behind the things that are the most important. Uh, I mean, there wouldn't be any wasted words, not that Jesus ever wasted words, but I would be focused on saying the things that were just pertinent. I mean, this is, this is last opportunity to talk to these guys. And so that's the context of what he said. And look down here in John chapter 13 and in verse 33. He says, Little children, yet a little while am I with you, and you shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. And if you go back in the book of John, he, he had said this about his death. And uh, they weren't going to be able to follow him. And uh, he was saying that now to his disciples. And then in verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You know, probably every person in here has heard this before. But I, this weekend, I want to really try and drill this home that this is a new commandment that Jesus gave to us to love each other as He had loved us. You know, that is huge. That is big. And most people have probably heard this, but in reality, most people do not really think that this is something that can be done. We just pass off our humanity and say that, you know, we just can't operate in love and we can't do all of these things. And yet, Jesus, this is His last instruction and he's telling his disciples that this is my new commandment, not a suggestion. This is a commandment that God gave us not only to love, but to love in exactly the same way as he had loved us. And one of the points that I'm going to try and really get across this weekend is that one of the reasons we do such a poor job of this, of loving other people, is because first of all, we haven't received the love of God. You can't give away something that you don't have. And there are many of us who try and love other people through gritted teeth, but the reason it doesn't seem to flow out of us is because you haven't really had an encounter where you have received God's unconditional love for you. And I'm not against anybody here tonight, but I am saying that our religious system that we live in today is not representing God well, I don't believe. And the majority of people today are being taught about a conditional love from God based on whether you're good enough and if you've done everything just right, then God will love you. And that is not the way that Jesus loved us. And so I think that there is a really misrepresentation about how God loved us. And one of the reasons that we are so judgmental and harsh towards other people is because we think that that's the way that God is to us. So before we can turn around and give this kind of love to other people, we have to have a renewed idea of God's love towards us. We've got to understand that God does not love you because you are lovely. That's a big statement right there. 
And yet, if I could sit down and talk to most of the people in this auditorium, and again, I believe that you guys are the cream of the crop. Thursday night, downtown Houston. This isn't your nod to God crowd that shows up on Sunday morning because you feel like you got to pay God off or do something. I mean, you're the fanatics or either a fanatic drug you hear, one of the two. So I'm not criticizing you. You're probably better than the average. And yet I bet you if I could sit down with every person in here and talk to you, there are so many people that just don't feel that they are worthy of God's love. They think that God's love is tied to your performance. They think that you have to do something to be made worthy for God to love you. And yet that is completely, completely contrary to the image that Jesus portrayed in the way he dealt with people. And so his command is to love others as he has loved us. If we haven't received that love for ourselves, it's impossible for you to turn around and give this to other people. And this is where so many people are. You know, in the church that I grew up in, they used to tell you, get born again. It was a Baptist church, and that's all they really preached was evangelistic messages about getting born again. And once you got born again, the only other thing they preached was go get somebody else born again. Go do a work for God. You got to somehow or another pay God back, justify your existence. I used to even have this statement said that the sole purpose for your existence here on this earth is to lead somebody else to the Lord. If all God had wanted to do was to bless you, He would take you to heaven. So the reason you're left here is to lead somebody else to the Lord. That's the sole purpose for your existence. And that they were in, do, doing that in an effort to emphasize how important that we make our life count and touch somebody else. And I agree that we do need to give and bless others. Paul said, I'm a debtor to all men. So I believe that there's a point, but... When, when the people said that, the Lord spoke to me and he says, well, if that was the sole purpose for your existence, then what about Adam and Eve? What was the sole purpose for their existence? They didn't have anybody to lead to the Lord. They didn't have anybody to intercede for. They didn't have church to go to. They didn't have a work to do. They didn't have a Sunday school class to teach. They didn't have praise and worship to lead. They didn't have any demons to cast out. They didn't have anybody to intercede for. They didn't have any clothes to pray for or houses to pray for. You know, if you were to take your prayer life and analyze it, how much of it is just really worshiping God and loving and receiving His love compared to interceding, binding the devil, rebuking this, interceding for that. And if you are spiritual, then your whole life revolves around binding the devil for somebody else and praying for them and doing stuff. But most people, their whole prayer life is all about getting something, doing something, binding the devil, doing something. What were Adam and Eve? What did they do? They didn't have any of that stuff to do. The simple answer is Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 says that this is what the angels are saying, saying in heaven right now. It says it happens constantly, 24 hours a day. It says that they fall down and throw their crowns before the Lord and they say, worthy, worthy, because you, uh, how does that go? Have you got that up there, Lord? <laughs> now art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The original purpose of all things was to give God pleasure. And that still is God's purpose. So Adam and Eve were created for God to just love and for them to love Him back and to have relationship. It was all about relationship. We're human beings. Sad to say, we should be, most people are human doings, but we should be a human being. You ought, to, you ought to be someone that just loves God, but it's all about doing. Everybody's got to do a work for God. And we tie God's love to us for something that we do. Adam and Eve didn't have anything to do. And yet God met with them every day in the cool of the evening. This whole concept the way that it's been presented ties God's love for you, His relationship with you, His pleasure for you to how good you are, how much you're doing, and whether you're doing all of these things. 
And I can just tell you, some of you may think that I'm exaggerating this, but I deal with thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and the people that I pray for, the vast majority come forward and immediately start telling me about why they're worthy for God to heal them. They start trying to say, I fasted, I pray, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I've been studying the Word. I go to church, I pay my tithes. I'm living as holy as I can. How come God hasn't healed me? You just told me why God hadn't healed you because you didn't point to what Jesus did for you. You pointed to what you did for Jesus and you think that you have to do things to make yourself worthy for God to move in your life. That is not the example that Jesus gave. This is not following the command that you love other people as I have loved you. One of the reasons that our relationships with other people are so poor is because our relationship with God is so poor. We think God is harsh with us. We think God is upset with you. You know, if you could ascribe to me the same qualities that the Holy Spirit has, that I would be omnipresent that I could read every thought that you have, that I was with you every second of every day, and I could read your thoughts, and if I was there reading your thoughts, and every time you did anything wrong, I was goading you, that's wrong, stop that, don't do that, don't think that, Man, 24 hours of me doing that, and I guarantee you, you would dislike me immensely. <laughs> if I could critique every single thought and action and just point out everything wrong that you do. See, that's the way most people think the Holy Spirit is. I'm not going to teach on this, but I got a great teaching out there entitled The Positive Ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't showing you that, hey, you're smoking, you're drinking. You lied. You didn't go to church. You didn't read your Bible. You haven't prayed enough. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts of one sin. One sin. John chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. One sin. And then in verse 9, it explains what that one sin is. The sin of not believing on Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not the one who's making you miserable because you haven't been studying the Word and you haven't been praying. That's religion the devil, and your own conscience. You have a conscience that tells you constantly whether you are doing what's right and wrong. And religion has amplified that conscience to condemn you and to make you feel miserable. Thank you for that one head nod. <laughs> Some of you are, <laughs> I'm not sure this is true. I could get plumb off the subject here. I'm trying to talk about as Jesus has loved us, but I'm countering all of the condemnation that religion has given us. It's been misrepresenting God. I was raised here in Texas. I was raised in the Baptist church. I have never in my 62, I'll be 63 in April. I have never used a word of profanity in 60, nearly 63 years. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I used to wake up when I was a kid that I had had a dream that I smoked a cigarette and I got caught and turned in to, my, to the police and the police turned me over to my mother, which was worse, and I woke up in hell, burning in hell because I smoked a cigarette. And I mean, I had reoccurring nightmares about this probably for 10 years, at least once or twice a year for 10 years. I would see profanity scribbled in a... A stall in a restroom and I'd feel condemned over that. I didn't write it. I just read it. The thought came through my mind and because of that I would be condemned for a week. Some of you are thinking, man, you were really messed up. <laughs> I really was, but you know what? I was very religious. And I didn't do some of the things that you all did, but I guarantee you I felt so condemned I felt so separated from God, and yet I was living holier than probably the vast majority of you in here. It wasn't God that was condemning me. It was my religion that was condemning me. They taught that we couldn't go mixed bathing. They didn't use the term mixed swimming because that would have sounded better. They said mixed bathing. That made it sound more ungodly where a boy and a girl were in the swimming pool together at the same time. 
We couldn't do that. You couldn't dance. Dancing was of the devil. I remember one time in my life, I was about 14 years old. I wasn't driving yet. I had my girlfriend talk me into going over to her house on a Wednesday night. First time in my life I ever missed a church service. And I went over to her house and turned out she had some other kids there and they were dancing. I felt like God was going to strike me dead. I tried it for a few minutes and man, I called my brother and my brother picked me up and I was at church before the service was out. Amen. I didn't miss the whole service. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I thought you were weird. I'm just saying, did you know what? It wasn't God that was condemning me. I remember when we finally, after we were in the ministry, we went over to Austria and we were ministering in Austria. And again, I was raised a Baptist. If you drank beer, you go straight to hell. You do not pass go. You don't collect $200. It is a one-way ticket to hell if you ever drink a beer. And I went to Austria and there was about two, three hundred people in the meeting and they were all sitting around round tables and they served them lagers of beer as long as I talked. Free beer. <laughs> and here was this Baptist boy preaching with everybody just drinking and that's one of the few times that nobody cared how long I went. They got free <laughs> beer just as long as I could preach. Man, my head was swimming with that when I was thinking, God, how does this work? And yet they were just worshiping God and loving God. And then I left from there and I went over into Romania. And in Romania, if you drank beer, you went to hell. But they smoked over there. <laughs> and in Austria, you could drink beer, but if you smoked a cigarette, you went to hell. Or excuse me, no, it was coffee. If you drank coffee in Austria, you went to hell. They couldn't, they just were, un, it was unbelievable to them that Christians in the United States would drink coffee because you go straight to hell for drinking coffee in Austria. And then you cross over into Romania and they drink coffee and booze, but you can't smoke a cigarette. And then you go over into Poland and it's different over there. And you know what? My little mind figured out, I think some of this must not be God. If it was... <laughs> If it was the Holy Spirit, it seems like it'd be wrong at all of these places. My lightning fast mind began to put some of these things together and figure it out. I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't take care of your body and that you should just go out and booze and smoke and do all that. But I am saying that, you know what? It's not the Holy Spirit that's showing you how wrong you are. The Holy Spirit convicts you of one thing, and that's your relationship with Jesus. If you're doing dope, the Holy Spirit's not going to say, why are you doing that dope and all of this and get on your case? You know what it'll all come down to? Is why don't you trust Jesus? Why do you turn to dope to numb you to life's things when, you, when Jesus is wanting to set you free and he's wanting to give you joy and peace? Why would you go out and get drunk and spend money and possibly ruin your health when all you got to do is turn to the Lord and you'll have joy unspeakable and full of glory. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. A person who's a drunk, a person who's a doper is a person who without maybe even realizing it is saying, my life is so miserable, I will ruin my health, I'll ruin the ri run the risk of people rejecting me. I'll spend buku bunches of money on things that are going to destroy my life and possibly kill me. My life is so miserable that I'll do all of these things for an hour, two hours, five hours worth of, of respite from it. You're confessing that your life is absolutely miserable. And so the problem isn't the, uh, the drinking and all this other. It's the fact that why don't you trust Jesus? Why, is, why aren't you able to draw on His joy and peace? The Holy Spirit is not the one that's making your life miserable. Religion is doing it. You know, we just got through with the Super Bowl. And they have these beer commercials. And they show all of these things about, you know, it's always something beautiful. It's always something attractive. It looks fun. 
What if every beer commercial they came on and said, why aren't you drinking a beer right now? What's wrong with, and if they went to condemning you, did you know what? You wouldn't have good feelings about beer and you wouldn't drink it. This is why they have beautiful horses running through the snow and doing all this stuff. What does that have to do with beer? It just is a good feeling and it makes some kind of an emotional connection with their product and that's the reason they do it. But if they came on and said, why aren't you drinking my product right now? Why aren't you doing this? And if they went to condemning you, you'd get to where you hate those products and you wouldn't take them. Well, in a sense, this is what religion has done. Why aren't you praying? You shouldn't be watching the Super Bowl. You should be praying. You should be studying the Word. How dare you do this? And they just condemn you and they're saying that this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden now you, you're guilt ridden about I should be praying more. I should be doing this. And you don't understand why you don't like doing it. It's because you've been condemned and beat over it. Even if you didn't like chocolate, which I doubt that you could be alive and not like chocolate. <laughs> but let's say that you didn't like chocolate. But if I came up and said, you sorry thing, you shouldn't like chocolate. How dare you like chocolate? And if I went to criticizing it and saying, you sorry thing, you'll never make it if you eat chocolate. If you start preaching, thou shalt not there's something on the inside of you that just rises up and says, bless God, I shall. I'll do it just to show them. You know, I learned this in Texas growing up, that if you wanted somebody to do something, just say, you can't do it. You're a sissy. I dare you. I double dog dare you to do it. And you know what? People that don't even want to do it will do it because you said they can't do it. You understood that as a little tiny kid. This is what religion is. You can't do this. You can't do this. And they're saying that God is upset and God's angry at you. And your old flesh rises up and says, bless God, I will do it. This is what religion has been doing. And it's been representing God as this one who's criticizing you. God, Jesus, loved people differently than what religion is portraying him as. His love is not conditional and based on your performance. Does that mean that your performance doesn't count? No, your performance counts because it either is allowing God freedom to move in your life or it's opening up a door to the devil. And so it is important how you live. And I'm not saying that you don't do what's right, but I am saying that God's love for you isn't dependent upon your actions. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for you when you had your act together after you had already cleaned yourself up. He died for you while you were yet a sinner. And that is not being represented the way that it should. Sometimes people will say, sure, when it comes to getting born again, you have to come before him as a sinner and sing just as I am. But then as soon as you get saved, you better straighten up and start coming to church and do this, this, and this. And that's not what the scripture teaches. Again, in Rome, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Jesus as your Savior? You received it just by receiving it. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You sang just as I am without one plea. But now that you're a Christian, you're told that if you don't come to church, if you don't pay your tithes, if you don't study the word, if you don't treat people right, if you get angry with your wife, if this happens, if that happens, if you've got any problem in your life, God won't bless you and you are taught a conditional love. That's not the way that you receive Jesus as your Lord. It wasn't conditional. Jesus died for you. It wasn't he will die for you if you will straighten up and confess things right and ask him to save you. Then he will come and save you. No, he already died for you 2,000 years ago. It's done. God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, will you receive it or are you going to reject it? That's the way that salvation was presented. And because of that, it was easy to receive because it was already done. You didn't have to earn it. It's just like somebody comes and puts it on a plate in front of you and says, do you want this? And it's just a matter of either believe and receive or doubt and do without. But then when it comes to receiving healing or something else, we're told that it isn't done yet. 
And it depends on whether you trust God and whether you do this and whether you go to church and if you pay your tithes and if you have to do this and this and this and if you will do all of these things, then God will move in your life. That is not accurate. That is a misrepresentation of God. He did not love you that way. There needs to be a change in our understanding of how He loved us and then... And only then, when we receive this unconditional love of God, will you turn around and give it to other people. The church is basically preaching and telling people to act in a godly way without ever having received this love of God that enables us to do it. And there needs to be a transformation. So I'm going to be talking about that all week. Let's look at this next verse. It says in verse 35, but... By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Notice he says that they will know that we are his disciples, not his converts. Huge difference here. I hadn't got time to teach on this. I've got an entire series. I've taught for four or five days on this one thing. But today we are making converts. We're telling people receive Jesus as your Savior so that you won't go to hell and people will confess Jesus as their Lord and say they're converted to Christianity, but they aren't disciples. The word disciple means a follower, a learner. And Jesus never told us to go make converts. He told us to make disciples. And this is one of the reasons that the church is in the mess that it's in because we changed the message from making disciples to making converts. We hold these big mass evangelism things and tell people to come down and receive Jesus as their Savior and then we just send them out. That's not what the Bible told us to do. That is, evangelism, the way it is done in the church today, is against what God told us to do. He told us to go and make disciples, not to make converts. You know, this good friend of mine, Don Crow, he was with us until just a couple of years ago, but we've been together for a long, long time. He was best man in my wedding. I was best man in his wedding. And Don Crow and I made this program we call Discipleship Evangelism. And when we started putting it into practice, Don, he, he used to do a lot of street evangelism, just go up and talk to people and pray with them on the street. And he was very convicted about what happens to these people after I pray with them. And we sat down and discussed that, you know, this isn't what God told us to do. He told us to make disciples. And so anyway, we made these materials and Don started going and knocking on doors. And instead of making it about getting saved, he made it about being a disciple. And he would just knock on the door and ask people, he says, is there anything that you need in your life that I could help you with? Do you need food? And if the people needed food, he would give them food. And then he would sit down and start teaching them what the Word of God had to say about how to prosper and how to trust God for your needs. And these are lost people. He didn't talk to them about getting saved. He talked to them about getting their needs met. And people were open to that. And they said, man, you mean the Bible says something about my prosperity? And Don would say, yeah. And so he'd sit down and start teaching them. And... As you teach a person about prosperity, this makes no sense to your natural mind. It doesn't make sense to, if you need something to take a portion of what you have and give it away. That's counterintuitive. That's illogical. It takes faith. And as you start teaching a person what the Bible says about prosperity, you will have to come to a place where people will say, how do I do that? That doesn't make sense. And then you have to say, it doesn't make sense unless... There is a God who said, when you give, it will be given unto you. So really, it just comes down to faith. Do you really trust in God? And he would talk to them about the Lord, and they would get born again. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was making a disciple, but you can't make a disciple without a person being born again and having a personal relationship with the Lord. So he would just start taking them through wherever they were. If they were sick, I remember this one guy named Steve, that Don went to minister to and Don knocked on his door and says, is there anything that you need that I could pray with you about and help you to receive from God? And then Steve says, well, I'm out of work because I've got back problems. My back's hurting. And Don says, I can teach you what the Word of God says and show to you about how to be healed. And so he says, come on in. It turned out he and his girlfriend, they were shacking up together. They were doing dope. 
they were on heroin. And so Don sat down and started teaching these to two dope addicts that were on heroin. They were high on heroin. And he started teaching them the word about how God can produce healing. And they liked it. They said, man, this is great. Would you come back and teach us next time? So he went for two or three weeks and he started teaching them how to get healed. People that were shacking up together, that were doing dope. And Don just started loving them and teaching them what the Word said. And as he did that, I guarantee you it comes to a place. How can I believe this? Specifically, he got off on the parable of the prodigal son. And he was reading the story about the prodigal son. And he was making points about how God deals with us. And he had this Steve read the scriptures and he stopped him when the prodigal son finally came to himself and started back home. And he just asked him, he says, so Steve, what do you think that that father is going to do? And he said, oh, I know what he's going to do. He's going to tell him, you can't have any of this inheritance. He'll kick him out. He, and he just started transposing into this story what he had experienced. And he started talking about how mean God was and, and the father and how he knew that this father would reject him. And Don says, well, read on. And Steve started reading about how the father ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and put a ring on his finger and killed the fatted calf and said, our son was dead and he's alive. And when Steve read it, he fell on his knees in the living room and cried out to God, God, would you accept me? And instantly he came off heroin. Instantly he got saved and born again. He and his wife received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I said I wasn't going to preach on this. I came real close to doing it. <laughs> but it says, By this shall all men know you are my disciples, by your love one for another. God never called anybody to be a convert. He is out to make disciples. He wants to take people and make you to where you are just like Him, where you can walk in His victory and joy and power. And one of the mistakes that we've made is, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And if all you preach is faith for getting saved, then that's all people will have faith for. The church hasn't preached being like Jesus and living in victory and walking in health and prosperity and joy and peace and marriage, harmony. We've been preaching get saved so you won't go to hell. And once a person accomplishes that, that's all they got faith for because that's all that's been preached. We should be making disciples, and here is the thing that all men will know you are my disciple, not your convert. We have very few disciples today. We have lots of converts. But here's how a person can tell that you are his disciples, that you have love one to another. You know, that is amazing. If you were to ask the average person, I've kind of set this up tonight, but if if you were just walking out on the street and you hadn't had somebody build up to this point, if somebody just walked up to you and says, what's the distinguishing characteristic of a Christian? There's a lot of people that would say a lot of different things. There's some people that would say, well, it's how they dress. There's people that if you wear any gold, if you have a wedding band on, if you have any makeup on as a woman, if your hair is short, if your dress is short or whatever, and that's, that's how you tell a true Christian their dress will be all the way down to the ground. They'll look bland. Their hair will be in a bun. They'll have a little um, covering on their head or, you know, just all kinds of things. That's what the distinguishing characteristic is to some Christian. And it's uh, kind of coincidental, I think, that those people who put so much emphasis on the outward appearance are some of the meanest people that there are. Jesus said, here's the distinguishing characteristic, that they love one another. It's not whether the guys wear a beard, whether the... You know, I'm, I'm not against people wearing makeup. Man, if your barn needs painting, paint it. Praise God. If it needs two coats, give it two coats. Here's one of the things you'll recognize about religion. Religion always puts the emphasis on the external. It'll always be about how are you dressing? Are you paying your tithes? 
Do you have the right mannerisms? Do you say hallelujah? Do you lift your hands like this or do you do it like this or do you do it like this? Or, and it's always on the external. Do you have your collar turned around backwards? Do you dress a certain way? Do you do all these things? God looks on the heart. God looks at the inside of a person and it's not about how you act outwardly. God is more concerned about the heart Religion will always look on the outside. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, uh, the Lord was speaking to Samuel and he said, Don't look on the height of his stature or any of these things because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. This is talking about when he picked David. David was the runt of the litter. And Samuel was going to choose Eliah because he was the biggest and the strongest. And God said, don't look on the outside. Look on the inside. Man looks on the outside. Religion will always put the emphasis on how you act. You could go out and corral Saturday night, get drunk, go have sex with a prostitute. But if you come to church and if you're dressed properly and if you pay your tithes and if you look holy, you would satisfy most religious people. Your heart could be just as wrong as it could be, but as long as you are in the pew and you pay your tithes, that would suffice with most people. Religion will always somehow or another bind you in your actions. God also is concerned about your actions, but actions are a byproduct of relationship with God. In the New Testament, it's not about what you do, it's what about what's in your heart that makes you do what you do. It's very similar to the, in the Old Testament, people couldn't have their life changed. They couldn't be born again. They couldn't get a new heart. And so God treated the Old Testament people similar to the way we treat children. You have to correct children and tell them that this is wrong. And before they understand things and can figure it all out, you just tell them, do that again and I'll spank you. And they may not know that there is a God or devil, heaven or hell. They may not understand any spiritual things, but they can understand that if I go over there and take that toy from my sister again, I'm going to get a spanking. And if you wait until they're old enough to reason with them and say, did you know if you take that toy from your sister, you're violating what Jesus said. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So you are actually submitting yourself to the devil. You're selfish. And you are establishing a principle that, you know what, you'll never be able to keep a job because you're only going to be thinking about getting your paycheck, not realizing you've got to do something and that you've got to work and you've got to give. And if you ever get married, you'll never keep your marriage because you'll be selfish. And that's the root of all strife and division. And you try and tell that to a one-year-old and they'll just look at you. But you can tell a one-year-old, you go over there and take that toy again, and I'll spank you. And they will resist the devil. They'll say, no, I'm not going to do that because of fear of punishment. That's what the Old Testament was. They couldn't be born again. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. People under the Old Testament weren't born again. They couldn't understand spiritual things the way that we can. And so God held them in check by carnal, outward, exterior things. You go pick up sticks on the Sabbath day and I'll kill you. Go do this and we'll stone you to death. We'll smite you. But in the New Covenant, God's... Man, I've got so much to say. He says a new commandment. A new commandment I give you. What's this new commandment? It's not about do this and do this and do that. No, it's about love. As I have loved you. It's about a heart matter. God comes along and in the New Testament, He changes your heart. Does he want, is it okay now to go rob and steal and plunder and commit rape and murder and everything because we're under a new commandment? No, it's really the same thing. It should produce the same results of living a godly life. But now we live holy as a fruit and not a root of salvation. It's a byproduct of having the love of God in our life. And if you ever understand and receive the love of God, you'll live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. If you have to teach somebody, go out and tell somebody about Jesus. Witness for the Lord. 
And you have to condemn them and then sing these songs about will there be any stars, any stars in my crown when at evening at last I lay down. Any of you ever seen that song? And the one about must I go and empty-handed, must I meet my Savior's soul, not one soul with which to greet him, must I empty-handed go. That's a tearjerker. <laughs> and then they'll tell you some story about your neighbor who stands in front of God and is condemned to hell, and right as they drag him and are about to throw him over the pre pre precipice into hell, he comes right by you and he puts his finger in your face. Why didn't you ever tell me? And then the altars fill up and everybody's down here repenting. You know what that's all about? You. You didn't care for your neighbor what it is. You mean, I'm going to be embarrassed? I'm going to be shamed? I'll stand in front of God and... And so you go do something because of self, not because you love other people. If you're having to use that kind of stuff to motivate people, go tell somebody about the Lord. If you don't, God's going to judge you. Your blood's going to be on their hand. That was the Old Testament motivation. But in the New Testament, you tell people about how much God loves them, and you will have to start restraining them from going out and telling people and saying, now wait a minute, let me give you some wisdom. Let me tell you what to say. If you're having to, you know, here's another example. If you had a little kid and at Christmas you give them a brand new bicycle, how many of you would have to say, now you go out and tell all of your friends how wonderful your dad is and how much you spent on this bike and you make sure you tell everybody that your bike's better than their bike and make them feel bad. Nobody ever has to do that. You know, you do just the opposite. And say, now don't go out and make all of your friends feel bad stuff. You know, don't try and tell them how much this bike costs. When a person is really excited about what they've got, you have to slow them down and give them wisdom so that they don't try and condemn other people and do stuff. If you are having to con compel people to go witness for the Lord, it's because they don't know how good God is. They've never received it for themselves. It's possible that they got born again, but they got converted. They aren't a disciple. They've not understood the love of God. Once you understand the awesome love of God, I guarantee you, you will have to do something to keep that person from talking. Like I said, I got born again when I was eight years old, the first time God ever really convicted me. And I was an introvert. I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to them. And yet, I forced myself, I psyched myself up and made myself go witness. And I would do about five or six visits on Tuesday night and five or six visits on Thursday night. Every week of my life, I led people to the Lord from the time I was a little kid until I was in uh, college. And I did this every time. And it was especially hard because I was an introvert. I'd have to just force myself. I had a spiel memorized. And I would, didn't want anybody to get me off topic because I couldn't answer a question. I wasn't responding to anybody. I'd just go up and use the Roman road. Romans 3.23, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 5.8, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then I'd say, is there any good reason why you can't pray with me and get saved? And there's very few people that say, well, yeah, I want to go to hell. And so I'd have people repeat after me and I'd grab their scalp and I'd go back to church and I'd stand up there and they'd pat me on the back and tell about how many people I led to the Lord. I doubt if any of them or very few of them got born again. It wasn't about those people. It was all about me. I was trying to earn something. I was trying to do something so God would love me and accept me. And I thought I was doing something awesome because I'd witnessed to 10 people a week. And then, March the 23rd, 1968, God revealed his love to me. Now, I'd already been a Christian for 10 years. But I had an encounter where God showed me his love for me, independent of what I deserved. It wasn't based on anything. Matter of fact, it was when he showed me what a hypocrite I was, and I finally had nothing to offer God. And God's tangible love came on me for four and a half months. I was gone someplace. And you know what? Instead of making those ten visits a week, I quit. And see, some people think, uh-huh, that's what I thought. 
The reason I quit was because I realized I was passing up 100 people every day to go make two or three visits at night. I quit going out and knocking on doors, and I just started talking to everything that moved. I'd witness to people in 7-Eleven stores. We'd go into a restaurant, and I'd stand up and pray at the top of my lungs and bless the food and everybody in the whole restaurant. And when they get through, they'd look at me and I'd say, Hey, you need your food blessed too. Hey. Now, let me just say, that's not the way to do it. But I'm saying, see, I just had a desire. I witnessed to everything that moved. I actually at one time made a decision. I would never see a person that I didn't talk to him about Jesus. And you know what? That's impossible to keep. I remember when I got drafted and was standing in attention in the army and I saw thousands of people marching by and I thought, I don't think I can keep that commitment. <laughs> Amen. How do I do this? And I had to finally realize I can't do that. But for about a year or two, I tried it. I witnessed to everything that moved. I, every person I saw, I talked to. I quit making 10 visits a week and I started making over 100 visits a day because of the love of God. I don't know if I'm getting across what I'm trying to say to you, but you can't give away what you don't have. And many people don't really have a revelation of how much God loves you. It's been misrepresented. It's been presented as a conditional love. And because of that, you are treating other people basically the way you think God's treating you, which is not very good. And you only treat people good when they deserve to be treated good. Because that's the way you think God's treating you. And that's not true. And this is the reason that people don't know that we are his disciples. Because we aren't operating in an unconditional kind of love. Man, there's so much fighting and bickering. Sad to say, the church is where a tremendous amount of strife and fighting is. And this is specifically talking about that this is how they will know you're my disciples, by your love one for another. This isn't just talking about love for the lost. That is a good thing. But this is talking about love among brothers among Christians. This is how the world will know that we are his disciples when we love each other the way that Jesus loved us. You know, right now, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat doesn't matter, but you see these presidential elections going and the, and the Republicans are just beating up on each other. I think Obama must be sitting there liking all of this, amen? He doesn't have to do anything. They're doing it to themselves. And in a sense, this is what the church is doing. I'm sure that the devil probably sits down and thought, I never thought of doing that. Look at how they are criticizing each other. They're arguing over the color of the carpet. They're arguing over whether it's pews or chairs. I would have never thought. Probably the devil takes notes on how Christians get mad at each other and some of the stuff that they do. We're supposed to be loving one another. And yet there is a tremendous amount of division in the body of Christ. Did you know that the first century church didn't have any of the advantages that we've got? Man, I'm on television and reach half of the world's population. Over 3.2 billion people can watch my program on a daily basis. Paul never had that. Paul never had CDs, books. The only tracks that anybody ever saw of Paul's were the ones he left. And yet Paul turned the world right side up in 30 years. The body of Christ had basically evangelized the known world in 30 years without printed page, without television, without media, without Facebook, without Twitter, without the internet, without any of this stuff. They made a bigger impact on their society than our church has made on our society. And you know why? Because Jesus said, this is how all men talking about even unbelievers, will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And there is so much division in the body of Christ. Did you know back in the beginning, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Corinth, to the church at Philippi, to the church at Colossae, the church, one church in one place. Ephesus, I don't know exactly how big that place was, but they had this amphitheater there. 
that sat uh, nearly 100,000 people, and it has been estimated that the body of Christ, the church in Ephesus, during the time of John, when he was there, he died in that area, and Timothy was the first bishop of the church of Ephesus, and I've read commentaries that they estimate there was at least a minimum of 50,000 Christians in Ephesus on up to 100,000 Christians, and there was only one church. They didn't have one place that they met in, they meant in maybe a thousand different homes, but there was one church. Timothy was the bishop over it. There was only one church in one place. They were all united. And there was problems. You can read about it in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. And, he, and Paul talked about, I know that there's grievous wolves going to come in and they're going to say this. And you had to deal with it. It wasn't perfect but they were in unity, and as a result, that generation basically evangelized the known world. Today, we are so fragmented. There are churches across the street from each other. And the people in one church have never even met the people in another church. It's not exactly having the same love for each other that Jesus had for us. Think about this logistically. Let's say that God gave me a message for Houston. And if this was a God-given message and God spoke to me, appeared to me in a vision and told me exactly what to say, how would I get that message out to the body of Christ? The church is so fragmented that I could go to some of these big churches that have 15, 20,000 people in it and I could reach a certain segment, but there would be other parts of the body of Christ in Houston that would never hear about it. I could spend the rest of my life hitting every church in the Houston area and never get this message to every person in Houston because it's so divided. That is not what God intended. He intended for us to be one, to love each other as Christ loved the church. And yet most of us have grown up with this division. We just have embraced it as being normal. Many people have never even questioned it. And I'll tell you this, I don't have an answer for this. I'm describing something here that in a sense is creating a problem because I don't, I don't have a solution to how we get all the people that are so split and divided into all of these groups operating as one. But I can show you from Scripture that this is, this is how Jesus said that we would win the world is by our love. When, by, when they saw that we loved one another as Christ loved us, then the world would know we were His disciples. If we ever become one, then the world will be one. W-O-N. The greatest tool for evangelism is the love among believers and our commitment to each other. Man, that's awesome. And you know what? You won't hear this very often. We'll talk about organizing crusades and going out and making converts and we do all of these things that are contrary to what the Lord told us to do. He didn't tell us to make converts. He told us to make disciples. And we will do all of these things and put tremendous amount of effort into all of this stuff. But man, the unity of the body, the oneness, loving each other as Christ loved the church will not be the focus of very many churches. And we just, in a sense, have embraced it, have accepted it, have put our stamp of approval on it, and don't even strive for it. Again, we may not be able to totally affect the end. I'm
You've changed my life with your words and motivation. You helped me to become a better person. I feel so great about your love. Never felt that before. You've changed my life with your words and motivation. Entire body of Christ worldwide and do everything, but you know what? You could affect somebody. You could become a disciple and begin to start loving the people around you and start walking in love. And this is what Jesus said. This is His new commandment. You know, let me point this out. Over in Romans chapter 13, look at these verses. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. In Romans chapter 13, in verse 8, he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. I could spend a lot of time on that. Owe no man anything. Again, this isn't a suggestion. It's a command. Owe no man, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Again, religion will come along preaching the old commandments. And that's what these were, a list from Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. Religion will come along preaching the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, don't owe any man anything except to love them. I give you a new commandment, and this says that every commandment would be kept if people loved each other. Just look at some of these right here. In the ninth verse, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you truly loved your mate as Christ loved the church, you would never commit adultery. I could spend all night trying to justify that because there's people saying, Oh, I do love my mate, but I just couldn't help myself. It's a lie. You're driven by lust, not by love. Lust is something that comes and goes and hits you and does this, but love is a decision. And mo again, most people don't know what God's kind of love is. They grow up watching movies and television, and they're exposed to this humanistic, demonic, carnal, selfish love. People fall in love and fall out of love. If you can fall into love and it just strikes you, you picture it by a little fat baby that goes around and shoots you with an arrow, Cupid, that's not love. That's lust. Love is a decision. God so loved the world that He gave. Jesus loved us. And I can guarantee you, when He hung on the cross, He wasn't having just strong emotions and goosebumps go up and down His spine. 
He chose to love us. He chose to do something. God's kind of love isn't an emotion. It may in, uh, involve your emotions and touch your emotions, but it is so much deeper than an emotion. And yet people today say, well, I just fell out of love. I can't help it. Every one of us has seen some movie where some person said they quote unquote love their mate, but then some beautiful woman comes walking by and all of a sudden they fell out of love with their mate and they fell in love and they just, it's just chemistry. I can't help it. I didn't want to do it. They go and apologize. I'm sorry, but it's just over. I can't help myself. That's not God's kind of love. That's lust. And many Christians don't know the difference between the two. And so they'll say, I just couldn't help myself. It's because you've never experienced a true God kind of love. God's kind of love is a decision that you make and you can choose to love your mate. If you loved your mate the way that Christ loved us, unconditional, and I'll be explaining this in a lot more detail, then you know what? You'd never commit adultery. A person that commits adultery does not truly love their mate. Somebody sound wow. I disagree with that. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. It says right here, it says that thou shalt not commit adultery and all of these things is comprehended in this one statement, love thy neighbor as thyself. If you loved your mate as yourself, you would never commit adultery. If you've ever had your mate commit adultery on you and you think about how that hurts you and the way it made you feel, if you loved your mate more than you loved yourself, you would never do that to them. You were loving yourself. The truth is a person that commits adultery is a person that loves themselves more than they love their mate. Period. There is no argument about that. You can argue it, but you're arguing the wrong thing. It says, thou shalt not kill. If you loved another person as you loved yourself, you would not kill them. Man, how dumb can you get and still breathe? People that go out and kill do not love the people that they kill. If you operated in love, there would be no murder. There would be no, none of those kind of things. Thou shalt not steal. Did you know stealing? Have any of you ever had something stolen from you? Then you feel violated. It hurts you. It bothers you. If you loved other people, you would never steal from that person. You are an absolutely selfish, totally self-centered person. You aren't thinking about anybody but yourself. You are in love with yourself. You think you're the center of the universe and the world revolves around you if you're a thief. If you loved other people, you would never do that to a person. It doesn't matter about what they've got. A lot of people work for big organizations and you think they'll never miss it. You steal five minutes at break and you just take an extra five minutes, they'll never miss it. You take pens home, you take this home, you steal because it's a big corporation, they'll never know anything. Would you want somebody to do that to you? If you loved other people the way you love yourself, you'd never steal from them. The next thing it says, it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Did you know that when you lie about something, you are manipulating people. You are making a fool of people. They are trusting you. They're putting faith in you and trusting your word and you're manipulating and misrepresenting things. You're taking advantage of that person. You wouldn't want anybody to manipulate and take advantage of you. And yet, anytime you lie and misrepresent something, it's because you are thinking only about yourself and how this will benefit you and you forget that person, hurt them, do whatever to them. It doesn't matter because after all, I've got to look out for myself. You just keep pulling back the layers and I guarantee you, a person who's a liar is a person who does not love the other people. You are hurting and manipulating and taking advantage of them. It says in, the, in um, John chapter 8 verse 44 that the devil is the father of all lies. Every time you lie, you are having intercourse with the devil. You are letting the devil flow through you. 
If you loved other people, you would never lie to them. This would solve everything. See, the Old Testament didn't give the, the root. It only dealt with what's wrong. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. But in the New Testament, you go below that. And you go to what is the real problem? The real problem is that you've never received the real God kind of love. You are a person who loves yourself more than you love God, more than you love other people. And because of that, you will lie, you will manipulate, you will stab a person in the back, you will do anything that you can do because you love yourself more than you love anything or anybody else. And in the New Testament, that's revealed. And so the antidote is to find out how much God loves you. And then, once you receive this unconditional love and understand that God loves you, not because you're lovely, but because He is love, and you start loving other people that way just by accident, as a byproduct. You'll never steal. You'll never lie. You'll never commit adultery. You'll never murder. Once you understand how much God loves you, and if you could receive that and then start giving this to other people, you would live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. It would just be a byproduct. Isn't that powerful? Look in Matthew chapter 22 at these verses. I'm trying to wind this down, but just got a lot to say. I'm going to say this quickly, maybe. Matthew chapter 22, there was a lawyer that came to Jesus. In verse 35, one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest, the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This astounded this lawyer. Look at this. And it says, while the, Fer and, uh, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. He went on and asked them a question. But anyway, it, no man was able to answer him after this, it says in the last verse. These people were just astounded. Nobody, nobody would have said that the greatest commandment is loving God and loving people. They would have listed, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall not covenant. You shall, and they listed all of the shall nots. God listed all of the shells. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And it just astounded the people. It was, it was in the Old Testament law, but it was hidden by all the extra things because the Old Testament law dealt with people's actions and outward things. The New Testament deals with your heart. And brothers and sisters, most of us have not really moved into the New Covenant. We are still living under an Old Covenant law mentality thinking that God is angry and he's trying to restrain all of these outward things and we've missed God's love for us and then releasing that love to other people and because of it, we're trying to grit our teeth and hold on and force ourselves to do what's right. Man, if you would ever receive how much God loves you, you would just find it would come flowing out of you. You couldn't handle it. I can testify, I've already given that example about myself, and I can testify of so many other people that once they get a revelation of how much God loves them, all of this carnal stuff and sins and the things that we do that are so stupid, they just start falling off. The root of all sin is your own self-love and your own dependence upon yourself. And once you ever understand how much God loves you, I guarantee you it will just shatter this self-love. You'll totally get to where it doesn't matter that much about yourself. God is more important. Our whole society is based on what is good for you. And you know, I hesitate to say things because I know we got all kinds of different people here and some of you may take offense and get mad at me, but praise God, I'm leaving town in a couple of days. So. <laughs> But you know, so much of the division that we see in the United States, 
is because of people just thinking only about themselves. They are God, and the world revolves around them. And if it, in, if it is good for them, or if it inconveniences them, then they are for it or against it based on how they are. For instance, and again, people may disagree with this, but you know what? When it comes to abortion, they'll sit there, what about the woman's choice? You aren't thinking about the woman. Well, you aren't thinking about the child. It is the woman thinking only about herself. And this is inconvenient. And I may not have enough money to raise this baby, so let's just kill it. It's, it all comes down to a selfish thing. And you will find out that most of the people who sit there promote women's choice and all of this kind of stuff will sit there and be just violent and upset over the snail darter or over a whale or over something like this. And then... Yeah, they, they show these uh, advertisements about the dogs. And, and I just sit there and think, and, until you quit killing babies, quit trying to condemn me over not taking care of your dog. Amen. But you know what that comes down to? It's just selfish. It's just selfish. But it would be inconvenient. What about my finances? Anyway, I could just go on and on. But you just start talking about stuff like this, and this is really what it boils down to. If people loved God and loved people more than they loved themselves. They wouldn't do all of the social ills that we do to each other. We wouldn't have these problems. It really all goes... You cannot put enough laws down. You can't put enough rules down to control society. John Adams, the second president, the first vice president of the United States, this is a quote from him, he said that democracy is totally unfit for anybody but a moral people. If America ever ceases to be a moral people, then democracy will actually destroy this nation. And that's exactly what's happening. There was a time that people loved God and other people, and they had a compass that was a moral compass that some things were bigger than them. But today... Say 
We've got people that are all wrapped up in themselves. And if you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. And we've got people that just live for themselves. And so, man, give me welfare. Give me whatever. And they don't realize that if, if they give you something for free, then they had to take it from somebody else. That's an ungodly principle. You can't do things like that. But they don't care. Let's vote for whoever will give me whatever. Give me free drugs. Give me free medication and I'll vote for you. I don't care if you destroy the nation as long as I get mine. There used to be a time when people realized that there were things more important than you. And see, understanding God's kind of love, if you ever receive, it is so selfless. It is so pure. God so loved the world that He gave. Once you understand and receive the love of God, it will transform the way you think about all kind of social things. It'll transform the way you think about people. You would never lie to them. You'll never take advantage. You would operate in integrity. You would treat your employer the way you would want to be treated if you were the employer. It would transform your life. Our society would be transformed if we loved one another the way that Christ loved us. So I've said all of these things tonight just as introduction to say that this is really important, what I'm going to be talking about. Amen. And the rest of this week, I'm going to be talking about, so how did God love us? And how do we turn around and love other people as Christ loved us? And you know, really, out of all the things I minister on, this is probably the hardest. Because... People think that, oh, I, I've heard that God loves me. Oh, yeah, Jesus loves me. This I know. And they think that they know this, and there is a disconnect, and people don't listen. But I'm telling you that if you really had God's kind of love in you, I'm going to use a lot of these scriptures, but Ephesians chapter 3 says that if you understood the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love of God, you would be filled with all the fullness of God. So, if you aren't filled with all the fullness of God, if you just aren't to a place where you can't hardly stand it, you're so happy, you're so blessed, you're so anointed, you are so hopeful about everything, you're optimistic. If that's not you, then you don't have a real revelation of the height, the depth, and the length, and the breadth of the love of God. Most people think, no, I understand that God loves me. That's not it. Let's go on to something else. But the love of God is what will set you free. And if you, have, if you have a sickness in your body, you don't have a full revelation of God's love because the Bible says in Galatians 5, 6, faith works by love. If you really understood how much God loved you, I guarantee you your faith would go through the roof and your sickness would go. It would be gone. It would produce health in your body. It would produce wealth. It would produce everything. The fullness of everything. You would be walking in the fullness of God, the greater revelation you have of love. So I'm just saying that I know many people think, oh, I already understand this. I don't need to know it. If you've got lack and inadequacy in your life, if you aren't just overwhelmed with God, then you need a greater revelation of, of love. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And I guarantee you, none of us have plumbed the depths of God. None of us fully understand how awesome He is. But... This love of God has changed my life, and I've got a lot of things I can share with you. I think that'll make a big difference, and this is going to make an impact in your life. Amen.